share this evening a, a story from my book called Stories from Texas. Some of them are true. I think uh, Dobie would like that title. And I, I'm, I'm actually, I've actually been deeply influenced by Dobie uh, because he was a collector of stories, and I was a collector of stories uh, before I ever became aware of, of, of Dobie's work, because I started when I was quite young collecting stories of folklore, mostly humorous, what some would call jokes, but they were really stories. They, they weren't just a one, two, three liner. They, they had to be developed and well told. As, as Twain said, uh, a humorous story has its humor not in the matter, but in the manner of telling. So I was always fascinated by those people who had the right style to animate the story and make it come to life, and I, I hope to one day be that person. So, as I started doing stories on radio, I was, uh, by that time, of course, very familiar with Dobie, and I thought, I want to do what he did in the sense of uh, helping these stories survive. Uh, Texas is a land of stories, and Dobie proved that, and he didn't let them die, and we have them here because of him. All of us who are writers or artists or folklorists, we are uh, Dobie's children. We are descendants of him, and we are carrying on his work. Well, this story was influenced by him. Uh, I call it Rattlesnakes, and it was influenced by the work that he did on Rattlesnakes. So here you go. If you could put all of Texas culture into one football stadium, which would be the right place to put it, you would need to reserve a large section for rattlesnakes. After all, rattlesnakes have always loomed large in Texas legend and lore. A friend of mine from Austria tells me that when Europeans think about Texas, they think of four things. They think of cowboys, cattle, oil, and rattlesnakes. That's our reputation. Well, this is not surprising at all. Seems like every Western ever made has a scene where a cowboy is surprised by a rattler and dispatches it with one perfect shot from his six-shooter. Well, having grown up myself in the brush country of Texas, I never found a pistol to be all that certain. I preferred a shotgun, a double-barreled one if there was one handy. Now, an old rancher told me that if I ever heard a rattler raising a warning nearby, I didn't need to look for him. All I needed to do, in fact, I didn't even need to aim. He said, you just move the gun over in that direction and the rattler will line up for you. He will aim for you. And he said, you pull the trigger, you'll get him most every time. I didn't like that most every time. I don't like the uncertainty of that. Because, you know, Dobie himself said that between the Nueces and the Rio Grande, we had an incredibly unusual abundance of rattlesnakes. And it was true, when I was growing up, they were everywhere. My mama had filled my head with all kinds of horror stories about rattlesnakes. They could put their tail in their mouth and make a wheel and chase you. If you shot one, he never died until the sun went down and his mate was sure to look for you forever. And they are always hiding up under the truck, my mama said, waiting for you to get out, so don't dawdle. Get out, get in the house. And if you cut a rattler's head off, you should never carry the head in your pocket because, as my mom told me, uh, there was a boy who did that and then absentmindedly, days later, put his hand in his pocket and got bit and died. Now, my mother told me later that she knew these stories she told us were exaggerated. She said, but you know, you can't raise boys on logic. It's best just to keep them scared. <laughs> well, the great folklorist J. Frank Doby said that there were two measures in a Texan's character. Did they close every gate they went through and did they kill every rattler they came across? It was a different time. Dobie regarded the snake topic as so important that he wrote an entire book about it. And being a professor, he gave the book one of those deep philosophical esoteric titles. He called it Rattlesnakes. 
He spends some time on stories about the biggest rattlesnakes ever found in Texas. Several accounts going back to frontier Texas claim the existence of rattlers 10 and 12 feet long, weighing 25 to 30 pounds. Some speculate that such giants existed back then because human encroachment had not been a factor long enough to cut short their growth. Such monster rattlers are not found these days except for those ubiquitous pictures on the internet using forced perceptive techniques. At the Snyder and Freer Rattlesnake Roundups each year, six-footers are not uncommon, and once in a while, you might find an an eight-footer, but never 10 or 12-footers, never. Dobie says, this is good advice here, Dobie says that if you want to make records in rattlesnakes, you need to do it far away from measuring tapes and yardsticks, and with as few witnesses as possible. He said, such things have a way, he notes, of making one cautious with the facts. Thank you. And by the way, they have his book, Rattlesnakes, over here this evening, so if you'd like to pick it up, it's a great read. It's a lot of fun. We also have his books over there. Yes, my books are there, too. (laughs) So, WF, I have a couple of questions for you as well. Dobie's autobiography is entitled Some Part of Myself, and in that autobiography he says, the brush country of southwest Texas is my carencia, which is Spanish for the place of the heart, the homeland, and that the ranch where he grew up had, has been a place where he belonged both in imagination and in reality, the soil that nurtured him. What do you consider your carencia, and how has it influenced you? Well, I had a very similar background to him, except I didn't grow up on, an, on, on a ranch myself. Uh, I grew up working farms and ranches in the area. Half of my county, Brooks County, was the King Ranch. And I got to hunt on the King Ranch as a kid, uh, legally, I had permission. <laughs> and, uh, but I would say that that my great love of the land was uh, really engendered by my uncle's ranch that was in Duval County, about 16 miles west of Falfurius, where I grew up. And I wasn't that far from where Dobie grew up. He spent a lot of time in Alice, so, you know, it's 36 miles south of there. But I would like him. I was in the brushlands and all that. So for me, the, the part that fed my soul really was uh, my uncle had a, a 40-foot windmill and I would often climb up there and sit on that windmill in the spring and, and, and watch uh, nature turn on the lights again after a long winter. And it was beautiful up there. I, I found it very peaceful, even though the windmill was squeaking behind me. I, I think that the squeaking of a windmill may be the only squeaking in the world that is actually comforting. Most of the time, squeaking is not a good thing, but the squeaking of a windmill somehow is a positive force because I think it's just saying, uh, uh, you know, we're pumping life out of the ground here. We're connected to life in the soil. And so my connection to the soil, uh, working on my uncle's farm, uh, harvesting watermelons, doing irrigation work, in fact, the the work ethic I got there was so brutal that uh, I made up my mind I would go to college. (laughs) And he did. And I did. (laughs) When I was 25 years old, I was already working on my PhD, and my father said, you know, I know I convinced you to go to college, but I think you're overdoing it. (laughs) So, um, but what I discovered is that because of my connection to the soil, my love of the land, you know, as my friend uh, Shelley Armitage says, who wrote uh, the Llano Estacado, she said, the land is lyric. And for me, it became a kind of poetry that, that fed me. And so when I ran into the literature of Doby and McMurtry and such, I found that the land was the literature and the literature was the land. There was a symbiotic relationship that was powerful and deep within me. And that's really why I did the radio stories, because I wanted to help other people love the literature of Texas. and. My hope was that by telling a little story or reading a paragraph, I could seduce them into getting the book and reading the novel or reading that beautiful nonfiction work, The Cedar Choppers, 
Uh, and that's, that's always my goal, is to seduce them into uh, more reading of this great literature that makes us who we are. Texas is a land of stories. It's, it's architectonic. It's made us who we are. And so we, we need to appreciate that. The other thing I'd like to say is that for me as a high school kid with very little literary knowledge, when I first came across Dobie and McMurtry and such, I was astounded that it was, in a sense, legal to write stories about your own place. Uh, and maybe in my ignorance, you know, I, I thought that literature was something that was about far off land and written of long ago, like Jane Austen, that's, that's what literature was. But could you write about people that were the same as my uncle and my aunt? Was it okay to do that? There was something magical when I experienced it. And then, uh, so I was then seduced into this literature and then eventually started writing my own, only in the sense that I'm celebrating the writers of others. I don't write fiction, I write nonfiction, and I try to capture the fascinating stories and animate them so people will, will love them and want to have more.